I'm Dr. Yvonne Kaysan, the president of Spiritual Awakenings International. It is my great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Mark Anthony, JD, psychic explorer, psychic lawyer. Mark Anthony is a fourth generation psychic medium, a near death experiencer, and an Oxford educated attorney who has tried over 100 jury trials. This psychic explorer has an extensive background in science, quantum physics, near-death experiences, history, archaeology, philosophy, and theology. He travels worldwide, exploring mystical sites, ancient ruins, mysteries, and supernatural phenomena. Mark appears on TV and radio, including the CBS TV, The Doctors, and Gaia TV's Beyond Belief. Mark Anthony co-hosts The Psychic and the Doc on Transformation Network. Mark Anthony is the author of three best-selling books, Never Letting Go, as well as The Afterlife Frequency and Evidence of Eternity, which were both considered for Pulitzer Prizes. I now present Mark Anthony. Thank you, everybody, for attending the uh... 2023 Spiritual Awakenings International Conference. Um, I'm Mark Anthony, JD, Psychic Explorer, also known as the Psychic Lawyer, and I'm a near-death experience researcher, um, a psychic medium. I facilitate communication with the other side. I'm an author, paranormal, and a supernatural uh, investigator, and I also delve into the study of ancient mysteries. And the presentation that I'm honored to give today is entitled The NDE Zone, Connected by the Light from the Cosmic to the Subatomic. Since the dawn of recorded history, there have been documented accounts of communication with the other side. And this can come in different forms. It can be in visitations, such as in a dream, or you feel the spirit of a loved one around you. It could be through a medium like myself. It could occur in the form of a near-death experience or in the form of a deathbed vision as well as shared death experiences. The truth is spirit communication is part of the human ex experience. The problem is it has historically been dismissed as fantasy or feared as supernatural and paranormal. And this brings us to the division between science and faith. Let's go with Sir Isaac Newton. He basically started, for lack of a, a better term, modern physics and modern science. He was a superstar of science in the Enlightenment era of the 18th century. While quarantined during the plague of 1665, he invented calculus, which has terrorized high school and college students ever since. Then he explored the laws of optics and developed the laws of gravity. And this is where modern science, the scientific method, really, really appeared on the world stage. However, Newton and his approach to science has led to what we now refer to as Newtonian reductive materialism. Reductive. Physical matter that is made of molecules which are composed of atoms. Materialism. The only thing that can be proven to exist is matter. Everything is a mix of matter and energy operating according to physical laws. Reality is what is observable, objective, and reproducible. The supernatural does not exist, neither do spirits, the afterlife, or God. Well, this leads me to what I have termed the Newton paradox, because the guy that started Newtonian materialist reductionism believed in God, but he didn't believe in the existence of an afterlife or the soul. And the thing about Newton, this is a guy that invented the laws of gravity, refined the laws of optics, invented calculus, and that's just the tip of, of what he brought to science. But the truth of the matter is that he actually spent more time studying the Bible, seeking hidden messages, than he did in studying science. I always found that amazing. But Newton said, atheism is so senseless. 
When I look at the solar system, I see the Earth at the right distance from the sun to receive the proper amounts of heat and light. This did not happen by chance. We know from science that life as we understand it depends on light. Take photosynthesis. Plants convert the energy, the electromagnetic energy of, of the sun into nutrients. And everything that we eat is either plant-based or, or we may consume animals, which in turn consume plants. But the building block of everything that we eat starts with the nutrients caused by, um, caused, uh, developed by plants through photosynthesis from the energy of the sun. Every great belief system describes the divine as light. The Hindus of ancient India refer to God as light. Moses encountering the burning bush. Native Americans refer to the great spirit as being light. Buddha taught people how to find the way to the light. Jesus, his teachings were about the light. Islam teaches about following the path to the light. And that's just a few of the belief systems in the world. And I love the saying that the medieval Islamic scholar Rumi said, the lamps may be different, but the light is the same. This now brings us to survival of consciousness, near-death experiences, and spirit communication. These phenomena are real and they can be explained through 21st century science. And understanding these phenomena begins with the common denominator of light. Albert Einstein said, matter is energy, energy is light. We are all light beings. Have you ever looked in a mirror and thought you saw a spirit? Have you ever tried to look directly at a comet in the night sky that had difficulty doing this? Ever thought you caught a glimpse of a spirit in your peripheral vision and then you turn and the spirit vanishes? The reason this happens has to do with the structure of the human eye. And within the retina, there are two smaller structures, rods and cones. Rods are at the periphery of the retina and they're light sensitive. Cones are at the center of the retina and they detect color and details. So with cones, think of these as best for daytime vision. They see details, they see color, but the rods is used for nighttime vision because they tend to be um, extremely light sensitive, not so much on the details. Astronomers have developed the technique known as averted vision. Averted vision is where, let's say you see a comet, and instead of looking at it directly, you observe it through your peripheral vision. Now, why is that? That way you're engaging the rods on the, on the fringe of your retina, and the rods are extremely light sensitive, so then you're going to be able to observe the comet much more clearly. Now, this has been extrapolated into paranormal investigations, and this is one of the things that I teach my colleagues in the paranormal investigation world is because so many people say, I thought I saw a spirit in my peripheral vision and then I turned and it vanished. Well, the spirit didn't vanish. It's just that you're switching from cones to rods. So you're going from daytime vision to nighttime vision. This is also why throughout history, spirits have been depicted as hazy and gray or white. Why? Because they're visible by the rods which do not see color. And so when you shift from cones to rods, it gives you the impression that the spirit has somehow vanished when actually they haven't. This brings us to the electromagnetic spectrum. So look at the EM spectrum. It includes radio waves, microwaves, infrared, visible light, ultraviolet, X-rays, and gamma rays. The reason I put the little white bar in the center under the visible spectrum is because that is the electromagnetic energy that is visible to the human eye. So think of the EM spectrum as a yardstick or for our friends outside the US, a meter stick and less than a centimeter width 
is what the human eye can see. And this is why people that have near-death experiences return from it and say that they saw colors that they couldn't even begin to describe. Why? Because they're experiencing and perceiving things that far exceed the scope of the human eye. Now, take a hummingbird. Now, we all like hummingbirds. I think everybody likes hummingbirds. I mean, you know, how cool are they? But scientists have recently discovered that a hummingbird can see ultraviolet light. So one of our fellow creatures on this planet can actually perceive colors that we can't because they have additional uh, cones in their eye, which are able to see in the shorter, more intense light wave frequencies of ultraviolet. Light is electromagnetic energy. And like I stated, it's the only form of electromagnetic energy visible to the human eye. We also know from the laws of thermodynamics and physics that energy is neither created nor destroyed. It's only transferred from one form to another. From science, and so we'll thank Sir Isaac Newton because he uh, correctly pointed out that everything is made of molecules, which in turn are made of atoms. However, Sir Isaac Newton did not have the benefit of 20th and now 21st century science because we now know that atoms in turn are composed of electrons, protons, and neutrons, which in turn are composed of a smaller particle of pure electromagnetic energy known as a quantum. And that's where the term quantum physics comes from, because everything on the smallest level is made of the same energy, which is electromagnetic energy. Now, for our science friends out there, an electron is actually a quantum because it is one eighteen hundredth the size of a proton. So I know if there's any picky science people out there, now we've got that covered. But this brings us now to the broader field of quantum physics. Matter and energy, which includes light, are composed of quanta and particles of electro, which are particles of electromagnetic energy. Let me let me pause just for a moment. When I say that everything is made of the same electromagnetic energy, that means you and me, our bodies, are made of electromagnetic energy. So are the chairs that we're sitting in. So are the radio waves, which are transmitting this program all over the world. So is the light of the sun. So is the surface of the moon and the distance between our, our galaxy and other galaxies. When you start thinking about this, it is rather overwhelming, but this is the beauty of understanding quantum physics. We also know that everything starting on the subatomic level has a vibration. And we all always hear this in the spiritual world, oh, like I got like good vibes and you know, people are always talk about vibrations. Well, they're right. And now we know from quantum physics that let's go to the quantum level. The reason that, that um, let's say an inanimate object, um, like, all right, like my water bottle. Well, the reason it's not alive is because its vibration is much lower and slower than mine is. And so everything has a vibration. All things in our universe are constantly in motion vibrating. Even objects that appear to be stationary are in fact vibrating, oscillating, resonating at various frequencies. As such, at every scale, all of nature vibrates. It all revolves upon frequency. Neuroscience is the study of the human brain. And the brain is essentially a carbon-12 and salt resonator floating in, in water in the fluid that's in your brain. It does have an electromagnetic field. Now, you can take a book on neuroscience about the brain, and there may be a thousand pages in the book, and with the and all of it is going to be about functions of the brain, but when it comes to consciousness, maybe there's a paragraph. And the official position of neuroscience is that the brain creates consciousness through chemical reactions and electrical impulses. But neuroscientists are completely at a loss to explain how consciousness is caused. So what are we? Well, think of your body like a car. Now, some people have really hot cars. 
And other people may look at those cars and say, boy, I'd really like to take a spin in that car. And then others of us, well, maybe not so much. The truth is we are not these bodies. What we are is energy which is referred to in psychology, neuroscience, and philosophy as consciousness. In matters of faith, it is referred to as either a soul or a spirit. This consciousness, soul, or spirit makes us unique, and it includes our personality, observations, memories, knowledge, and love. Consciousness is pure energy. It pre-exists the body, comes into the body, and then lives on after the physical death of the body, meaning it's eternal. Consciousness is capable of perception that far exceeds the scope of our five physical senses of sight, hearing, taste, touch, and smell. Remember earlier when I was talking about the hummingbird can see ultraviolet light, and people who come back from a near-death experience, or rather near-death experiencers, oftentimes talk about colors that, that they can't even describe. Why? Because it exceeds our five physical senses, and particularly uh, the sense of sight. And the, the consciousness, the soul, is capable of perceiving and communicating with other dimensions beyond our material world. Now, in the 20th and now in the 21st century, quantum physicists are on board with eternal life and that consciousness is not created by the brain. And one of my, my heroes is Professor Hans Peter Dorr of the Max Planck Institute in Germany. I mean, seriously, can you think of anyone more serious than a German physicist? And what he has said is the brain is like a computer hard drive. Once this hard drive dies, we do not lose the information, this consciousness, the body dies, but the spiritual quantum field continues in this way, we are immortal. Sorry, Professor Dorr, but I couldn't resist. However, Sir Roger Penrose from my alma mater, Oxford, has said, consciousness derives from quantum vibrations within the brains and neurons. In the spiritual sense, consciousness has been here all along. So what are we hearing now from some of the top quantum physicists in the world is that, hey, look, the brain didn't create consciousness, it merely hosts it. So when you look at physics, we know that energy is neither created nor destroyed, only transferred from one form to another. When we look at faith, all great belief systems from the sages of ancient India through Zoroaster, Mo Moses, Buddha, Jesus, Confucius, Lao Tzu, Muhammad, Native American spirituality, the animistic religions of Africa and of the Pacific teach us that the soul, the spirit, the who and what we are pre-exists the body and lives on after physical death. And that is why I have introduced the term, the electromagnetic soul, the EMS, which is a 21st century term to describe that our soul, our spirit, is pure consciousness, which is eternal electromagnetic energy. And I'm very humbled and honored that many scientists have now adopted this term, the EMS. And my good friend and colleague, Dr. Gary Schwartz from the University of Arizona said, let's look at the electromagnetic soul. Let's look at the soul part of it. That soul stands for the source of universal love. We know from the study of neuroscience that the brain has frequencies and brainwave frequencies are the electrical activity going on in your brain and it alters depending on what you're doing. The brainwave frequency of someone asleep is much different than someone who is awake. And as technology advances, and this is a very important point, this has yielded a greater understanding of exactly what brain waves represent and what they indicate about a person's health and state of mind. There are five main brain wave frequencies, gamma, beta, alpha, theta, delta. All right, gamma. Think of gamma as you're on the Jeopardy tournament of champions and your brain is running at full throttle and that's where you are really maxing out your brain. Beta is the awake and conscious state. That's what we're in now. That's what you know enables you to get up, go to work, deal with your family, you know, the activities of daily living. Alpha, 
I always make a joke and call alpha the groovy baby state, because that's where you either daydream, you start to meditate, you begin to relax. It's also when you start to drift off to sleep. It is theta, which is reduced consciousness, consciousness, but that's the dream state. And then delta, there's very little brainwave activity going on in delta, but delta is important because that's where your body fights infections, that's where you heal, but it is on the alpha-theta border where psychic and mediumistic activity occurs. Now, in this field, and when I say this field, I mean the, the uh, spiritually transformative experience field, the near-death experience researchers, the, the metaphysical field. We always talk about raising our vibration, and we know that everything from the quantum level on up um, has some, some form of vibration. And we talk about raising our vibration to communicate with spirits. And last year, when I was at the International Association for Near Death Studies, and I was speaking there, um, this, this gentleman from Sweden said, yes, but in if psychic and mediumistic activity occur between 4 and 13 hertz, he goes, that's a very low vibration, almost like a bass sound. And he was actually right on point. So let's look at when we say we're raising our vibration, what we're actually doing is clearing our mind. And in a sense, we're raising our vibration by getting rid of all the stress in our life. And by getting rid of that stress, it's making us more receptive to spirit contact and to receiving messages from the other side. So why not just use technology like an EEG, an electroencephalogram, which measures brainwave frequencies to detect the electromagnetic soul? Well, EEG, electroencephalogram, and QEEG, quantitative electroencephalogram, are very useful diagnostic tools, but they're neither sensitive enough nor designed to identify the electromagnetic soul, much less tune into the afterlife frequency. But that doesn't eliminate their importance in understanding the afterlife and the electromagnetic soul. Within the last two years, two very important discoveries have been made. In Tartu, Estonia, on February 2nd, 2022, an 87-year-old man had a, a, um, a stroke. So he was taken to the hospital um, standard protocol is uh, EEG. So the doctors there were monitoring his brainwave frequencies, and all of a sudden, he had a massive heart attack and died. And this was the first time in history that a human brain had been monitored by an EEG at the time of death. What happened was shocking. Dr. Raul Vicente from the University of Tartu, Estonia, wrote, just before and after the heart stopped working, we saw changes in a specific band of neural oscillations, so-called gamma oscillations, but also in others such as delta, theta, alpha, and beta. In other words, at the precise moment of death, this man's brainwave frequencies went off the charts. This is not what the scientists expected. And they also indicated um, the brain may be playing a last recall of important life events just before we die, similar to the ones reported in near-death experiences. Whoa, hold on. What's happening here is we may have the first recorded evidence of the brain shifting away, from, uh, excuse me, um, the soul shifting away from the brain and the energy intensifying instead of fizzling out, which is what, what neuroscience thought before that. And then there was the lucid dying study from New York University, what, which was released in November of 2022. Almost 600 people at 25 different hospitals in the United States and the United Kingdom um, were, were, being, uh, uh, were, were on an EEG while their heart stopped. In other words, they went into cardiac arrest, uh, EEGs were hooked up to their head while they were given cardiopulmonary resuscitation, CPR. Every single one of the EEGs recorded massive brainwave spikes, just like the EEG in Tartu, Estonia, except now we have 
hundreds of documented accounts. And one in five of the people who were resuscitated reported lucid experiences of death, which were not hallucinations, illusions, or delusions. Identifying measurable electrical signs of lucid and heightened brain activity together with similar stories of recalled death experiences suggests that the human sense of self and consciousness may not stop completely around time of death. In other words, your electromagnetic soul, the who and what you are, not only survives physical death, but remains conscious. And that was Dr. Sam Parnia from New York University. Dr. Shelley Renee Joy of the California Institute of Integral Studies has, has written that it is entirely feasible that there are specific ranges of harmonic frequencies that interact with mind-brain systems through resonance at far higher frequencies than currently supposed. In other words, when our soul is in, our electromagnetic soul is in the process of transition, it is interacting with a much higher frequency that we do not yet have the technology to detect. So I created this diagram to show you the ultra high vibration of the afterlife frequency and then the lower vibration of our material world dimension. And there are times when the two frequencies overlap and that's what I call the NDE zone. And in the NDE zone, in, in that zone between the afterlife frequency and our material world dimension, this is where interdimensional communication occurs. Mediumship, like somebody like me, facilitating contact with spirits. Visitations, where people who are not mediums will um, interact with their loved ones in spirit, either in a dream or they feel them around. Near-death experiences, shared death experiences, deathbed visions, and out-of-body experiences all occur when there's a frequency alignment of our electromagnetic soul with the afterlife frequency. So how does interdimensional communication happen? This brings us to quantum entanglement. Quantum entanglement, and this is from Edgar Mitchell, who founded uh, IONS, the Institute of Noetic Sciences, is also an astronaut, aeronautical engineer, and UFOologist, he stated that when subatomic matter is in a process together, subsequently the subatomic particles go apart from each other and they go across the universe. When they do this, they remain entangled. If you do something to one, then the other responds immediately instantaneously. Quantum physicists have theorized that even if those two particles are a billion miles apart, if you do something to one, the other one immediately responds accordingly. Now, how does this apply to spirit communication? All this frequency beacons. Think of everyone that you know, either in this world or in spirit, connected to you through a three-dimensional spider web. Let's take the spider out of it because, you know, but how's the spider web function? Well, if something hits the web, there's a vibration that travels along the web that alerts the spider. And this is how spirit communication works. Let's say that you're grieving someone you love very heavily, and all of a sudden you feel them around, or you suddenly turn on the radio and there's that song, or you smell a familiar scent. But they're like, like after my mother died, every time I got in my car, I kept smelling Chanel number no. five. Well, I can tell you this there was no bottles of Chanel number no. five lying around in my car, but that was her favorite, favorite uh, perfume. So, what happens is when we're thinking very heavily and grieving about a spirit, that's electromagnetic energy. Our EMS is emitting an EM pulse. Spirits pick up on that, it draws them to us. Conversely, they can send these vibrations to us. Like I just said, you're driving down the, the highway and all of a sudden you turn on the radio and there's that song that makes you think of this person. Now, this doesn't just apply to spirits. How many of you out there are parents and all of a sudden you feel something happen to your child and then you get the call and you know maybe they got hurt or, or something happened 
we are all interconnected. It's just more obvious with spirits because we're dealing with pure electromagnetic energy with them and us, we're just moving at a lower, slower vibration. There's also a physiological reason to this. Anyone that studies yoga is aware of the chakras. We have seven chakras and all seven chakras align uh, with the location of, of endocrine glands in our body. And there's two endocrine glands in particular, which are tied into spirit communication. One is the pineal gland, which is a um, small gland behind the center of your forehead, which is also known as the third eye chakra. The other is the solar plexus, which is in the pit of your stomach. The pineal gland, it's about between the size of a grain of rice and a lima bean. It has calcite and magnetite crystals in it, according to a recent uh, British and German study. It regulates our brainwave frequencies, including our reticular activating system. It regulates our circadian rhythms, which is when we're tired, when we're hungry, when we're energetic, when we're digesting. And isn't it interesting that it also regulates our ability to perceive light? And this is a very, very small organ, yet the most mysterious organ in the body, which has been studied for decades, and every day we're finding more things out about it. What was the first radio? A piece of quartz crystal with copper wire that ran electricity, low levels of electricity through that crystal. Well, in the pineal gland, we've got calcite and magnetite, magnetite having an electromagnetic field in our head. So basically, we do have a radio station, actually something much more sophisticated than that in our head. Then there's the solar plexus. Once again, everyone from yoga is aware of their solar plexus at the pit of the stomach. The reason it's called the solar plexus is because it refers to the, the resemblance of this bundle of nerves and the rays of the sun. And we've all heard gut feelings. Well, the reason that you have a gut feeling is because you're picking up that vibration in, in the, in the uh, solar plexus. You see, there, these two, the pineal gland and the solar plexus, are very important for spirit communication and psychic ability. It's through the pineal gland where we get the visual, the auditory messages, and the data, and it's the feelings, the senses, the, the feeling of foreboding that we get through the solar plexus. The solar plexus is the most complex bundle of nerves outside of the cerebral cortex. It's also been referred to as the second brain. Uh, other animals, other species have more than one brain. An octopus has five brains in its body. And so now scientists are looking at this massively sophisticated complex bundle of nerves in our solar plexus as performing the functions of a secondary brain. Mediums. We're like telephones through which communication takes place. Interdimensional communication occurs when a spirit transmits an electromagnetic impulse, which is received by the medium's brain. This wave of frequency is then translated by the brain into recognizable information. But what about people who aren't mediums? The truth is, Everyone is capable of experiencing interdimensional communication, whether or not you're a medium. Why? Because we all have the same basic physiology, which includes a pineal gland and the solar plexus. We're not all good at the same things. I mean, I can swim in a pool, but I'm never going to be Michael Phelps and win, what, 20-something medal, gold medals at the Olympics. I can play a guitar, but I'm never going to be a slash or a uh, you know, Ed Sheeran or, uh, you know, uh, Jimmy Page. The thing is, we're just all simply good at doing different things. Some people are better at it than others, but that doesn't mean that everybody cannot have a psychic or mediumistic experience. And that's one of the things that I teach in my latest book, The Afterlife Frequency. I develop what's known as the raft technique to recognize, accept, feel, and trust 
messages from spirits. And that's the raft technique. And I give examples and exercises on how to develop that so that you too can receive and benefit from spirit contact. This brings us now to near-death experiences, deathbed visions, and shared death experiences. A near-death experience, NDE, occurs when a person physically dies and the EMS separates from the body, but consciousness remains intact. And of course, the EMS comes back, and that's why people are able to talk about uh, what they've seen. And with the um, near-death experience, the EMS quantum leaps from one dimension to another. And I chose this gift because the vast majority of near-death experiences involve the sense of traveling through a tunnel towards a light, which is another dimension generally referred to as the other side. And tales of these resurrections, these miraculous recoveries, people dying, and then all of a sudden they come back and they have these amazing tales. I give um, another lecture called Rulers, Royals, Psychics, and Spirits, and I chronicle several famous people throughout history uh, and how their near-death experiences have, have influenced um, and not only them, but, but the world. And one of those people very well could have been Charles Dickens. And Charles Dickens was a student of psychic research. His book, A Christmas Carol, and I'm sure everybody has seen some version of A Christmas Carol, either in a play or as a movie, may actually be based on accounts of near-death experiences. Charles Dickens had very, very many, several close calls. He was even in a horrific train accident. And so he had many times throughout his life where he almost died. And when in his day and age, they had no term for this. And it wasn't openly discussed. Now, let's look for a second at A Christmas Carol. We all know Ebenezer Scrooge, he's the miser, he's the miserable, materialistic, narcissistic guy. It's all about money, he's very self-centered. And then on Christmas Eve, he is visited by the ghost of Christmas past. And the ghost of Christmas past shows him that, you know, you used to be a nice guy when you were young and you had a promising future, but then materialism started setting in, and you, you push love aside in favor of lust for money. Then the ghost of Christmas present comes to show him what his life is like and how people around him are, are pulling away from him. And then, of course, there's the ghost of Christmas yet to come, which shows him where his self-centered, lonely, materialistic life will lead. Now, these three ghosts very well may represent what is known as the life review. And the life review is the proverbial, my life flashed before my eyes. Near-death experiencers all talk about how their entire life flashes before their eyes. In five to 10% of near-death experiences, there's what we call a DNDE, a distressing near-death experience, which uh, its nickname is the hellish NDE, and that would be the ghost of uh, Christmas yet to come. And the hellish NDE shows you what can happen to you if you don't do a 100% turnaround in your life. Now, what happened in A Christmas Carol is after experiencing this Ebenezer Scrooge, forsakes the self-centered narcissism and reverts back to a man focused on love. And find me one near-death experiencer who hasn't expressed the same, the same change in the same sentiment. But on the flip side, excuse me, on the flip side of the karmic coin, is there a non-spiritual reductionist materialist explanation for a near-death experience? Hey, I'm an attorney. And so I know that you have to present both sides of an argument. You can't just say, well, my way is the only way. There are other ways of looking at this. And there's several attacks by the skeptical crowd and the reductionist materialist crowd that say that near-death experiences are only uh, a side effect of a dying brain. 
instead of going through all of them, which I do in, in another one of my lectures, the most persuasive attack is dimethyltryptamine, DMT. And DMT, which can be synthesized, and a lot of people take DMT, DMT is caused by a dying pineal gland. Once again, we're back to the pineal gland, and DMT is secreted by the pineal gland. And it induces a hallucinogenic state, a floating sensation, and it feels like a spiritual experience. So people who take DMT can sort of recreate the sense of a near-death experience. But what DMT does not do, it does not give you the sense of flying through a tunnel into the light, entering a transcendent realm, the other side. Veridical perception, in other words, all of a sudden, your, your soul gets up and travels through the hospital and sees what people are saying and doing, which can be proven after the in incident. It also doesn't give you contact with your loved ones in spirit. So, Benjamin Franklin. After years of experimenting with electricity, Benjamin Franklin flew a kite during a lightning storm to collect ambient electrical charges in a Leyden jar which is essentially a, an early version of a battery. And by doing that, he proved that there was a connection between lightning and electricity. And he did that on June 10th, 1752, exactly 271 years ago today. You know, I, I doubt ben, Benjamin Franklin thought that 270 years ago from today, he'd be part of a discussion about the afterlife and how science proves the existence of an afterlife. But I think if he did, he would have been fascinating because there's indications based on things that he wrote that he did believe in reincarnation. So, a few years after that, in 1780 in Italy, Luigi Galvani discovered that the muscles of dead frogs' legs twitched when they were struck by electricity. So you see here an electrode hitting a dead frog, and it's twitching. And Galvani coined the phrase bioelectricity, which is the electricity generated within an organism, especially by a muscle or nerve. Now, the reason I'm bringing this up is because the, the skeptical reductionist materialist crowd says that, well, we can recreate, we can artificially recreate a near-death experience, but artificial inducement does not recreate the authentic experience. However, it certainly gave Mary Shelley a great idea for her book, Frankenstein, a couple decades later. So the higher vibrational frequency of the other side dimension and our material world dimension, and occasionally they overlap. And this brings us to shared death experiences, which are multiple simultaneous near-death experiences. And that's a frequency overlap between the EMS and the afterlife frequency. Deathbed visions. These have been reported for centuries. And my, my friend and colleague, Dr. Jeffrey Long, whom I believe will be speaking tomorrow, uh, he founded the Near-Death Experience Research Foundation. He wrote, those dying may report seeing or hearing dead loved ones, religious or spiritual beings and or beautiful scenery. And uh, the painting that I found here is a painting of, of a deathbed vision where somebody who is, is dying and is in the transition from our world to the other side is encountering spiritual beings. We all remember Betty White, one of our favorite golden girls. I mean, I can't remember throughout my life when there wasn't a time Betty White was on, on TV. And she married Alan Ludden, who was a game show host. Uh, and they married in 1963 until he died in 1981. And she said that Alan was the love of her life. Betty died on New Year's Eve of 2021, 20, uh, right before 2022 began. She was 99 years old, a couple weeks shy of her 100th birthday. And uh, her caretaker and her best friend, actress Vicki Lawrence, 
which we probably remember from Mama's family and and also from the Carol Burnett show, said that just before Betty died, she looked up, she smiled, and she said, Alan. And then she let go. They believe that Alan Ludden was there to greet her as she left her body. Two other very high profile deathbed visions, Steve Jobs, the founder of Apple, right before he died, his family said he opened his eyes and said, oh, wow, oh, wow, oh, wow. Another one, highly controversial, was George Floyd. Now, I'm not here to play politics or, or stir anything up, but I am a near-death experience researcher. And I watched the film of, of um, George Floyd because there were several people with, with cell phones filming what happened when the police officer was on his neck. And the last thing George Floyd said was, Mama, I'm through. This very well may be the most highly documented deathbed vision in history. George Floyd's mother had died some years before him. He was particularly close to her. And the last words he was able to speak in this world were, Mama, I'm through. A shared death experience. At the time of a person's death, bystanders or onlookers observe phenomena associated with the energy of a spirit leaving the body, not just relatives and close friends, but nurses, doctors, and other medical personnel. People in close proximity to the dying person may see a transparent replica of the dying person leave the body. They may describe a feeling of leaving their own bodies rising to accompany their dying loved one partway toward the light. They may hear indescribably beautiful music. They may see spirits, apparitions of the dying person's loved ones coming to greet them. A brilliant light filling the room at the time of death. And this is Dr. Raymond Moody in his book, The Science, or in, in the book, The Science of Near-Death Experiences. I've observed all of these phenomenon because I've been called to a number of bedsides of people who are dying. Family members wanted me there in, in my capacity as a medium. And a shared death experience is overwhelming. It is humbling. And to be part of it is a tremendous honor. And thankfully, we now live in a time when people are stepping forward and these are being documented and recorded and given the respect that they're due. There's an overlap between a deathbed vision, a DBV, and a shared death experience. And I created this diagram to show you, there is the electromagnetic soul of the person in transition. And what's happening as he or she is dying, their, their EMS is expanding vibrationally and frequency wise as it's leaving the body. And the EMSs of people in close proximity who are not in danger of dying, but their brain waves, in other words, the electromagnetic frequency of the EMS of the person dying begins to interface with those in close proximity. It's the same, um, same thing that happens in mediumship. And so people around them will see the bright light, they'll see spirits, they'll hear the music, and then the person transitions and the shared death experience ceases. Spirit communication technology. Back in 1926, Thomas Edison believed he could develop the spirit phone. Unfortunately, he died before he could do that. In the meantime, uh, my friend and colleague, Dr. Gary Schwartz from the University of Arizona is actually developing technology known as the soul phone. But what about until then? What technology is there? This brings me to the best friend I ever had. Whew, that's my friend, Billy. We met when we were 11 years old. We went to junior high school, high school and college together. After, after college, I went to law school and he went to Australia and then he moved to Japan and he was a linguistics genius. He learned to speak Japanese, Cantonese, Thai, Indonesian, and he was teaching English to Japanese executives. And he invited me to go to Asia with him. And I took time off, much to the chagrin of my, uh, the partners in my law firm. But uh, hey, you know, life enriching experiences are much more important than, 
than uh, what I was doing there. And we traveled throughout Asia, and here we are in Japan at Kinkakuji, the Golden Temple. And the thing about Billy, we were both raised in the Catholic faith. His family was Irish Catholic, mine was Italian Catholic. And we had this ongoing debate about the existence of an afterlife. No, he didn't believe it. He was an atheist. He said, there's no science, there's no technology. And of course, I argued the other side, pun intended, that there is an afterlife. And it, it wasn't an argument. It was an intellectual debate. That's one of the things I just really loved about the guy. You know, he was really smart and we could have these incredible discussions. One of the greatest honors of my life is I performed his wedding ceremony. Uh, I was uh, not only an attorney, but I, I was a notary republic, a notary public at the time. And he met this amazing woman in Japan. And I remember I was standing on, on the platform and there's my best friend, Billy, and my new best friend, his, his, his soon-to-be bride. And it was it was overlooking the ocean at this beautiful hotel in Florida. And everybody that I loved was alive and they were there. My parents, his parents, all of our friends from high school, all, all my fraternity brothers, because you know, he was he was uh not a fraternity brother, but but a friend to us. Everybody was there. It was one of those shining moments in your life that make life worth it. And then a few years after that, he had a lot of problems going on, and unfortunately, he took his own life, and I was absolutely devastated. So about a year and a half later, I was a speaker at the Stanley Hotel. There was a paranormal convention going on there, and I was one of the speakers. And the Stanley is supposed to be one of the most haunted locations in North America. And I don't like using the word haunted. I like to call it a vortex because it's built atop um, a granite deposit that's loaded with quartzite crystals. So and a vortex is, is like a whirlpool of energy. Um, famous vortexes are Stonehenge in England, the Giza Plateau, Sedona. I mean, we could go on and on. And so I... I was was giving my talk and then I was done and I went on the conference floor and I was signing um, books. My, my, my new book had just come out, uh, Never Letting Go. That was my first book. And at the conference, there was a lot of people from, from uh, TV, a lot of the ghost hunters there, and they were all displaying different um, paranormal investigation equipment. Now, all of that, it scans different frequencies within the electromagnetic spectrum. There's K2 meters, trifield meters, spirit box scanner, digital voice recorders, thermal infrared camera. All of these scan infrared looking for anomalies and things particularly like digital voice in the spirit box scan the um, EM band, the radio frequencies, hoping to pick up on uh, voices of spirits. So all this is going on, and my manager, Rocky, she was with me, and she was walking around. I was signing books, and she was walking around looking at, um, at some of the other, other vendors, and there I was. I'm signing books. Okay, so I'm signing books, and all of a sudden, I hear, Mark, Mark, and I look up, and there's Rocky, and she's motioning me, and, and there's this um, um, uh, paranormal investigator next to her, this guy named Chris that I knew, and they're going, get over here right now. And there's this crowd forming. So I get up and I run over there. And, and Chris was displaying the spirit box scanner. And when I came running up to it, uh, it was, before I could say anything, all of a sudden out of this thing, I hear, dude. And I stopped and looked at it. And I look at Rocky and there's a tear rolling down her, her face. And then I hear, love you, bro. And I go, oh my God. She said, Mark, I was walking by this and it said, get Mark. And Chris said, do you think he means your Mark, Mark Anthony? And then it says again, get Mark. And when I run over there, I hear, dude, love you, bro. And Rocky knew Billy. And she said, Mark, that was Billy's voice. And I said, yes, it was. And Chris said, this is highly unusual. Number one, the, the spirit's voice came out of it, asked for Mark by name. 
And then number two, both of you positively identified this. Well, let me tell you something that really, really floored me. Look, I'm the medium. I'm the one that's used to, you know, giving people connections where they're taken aback, but now it was happening to me. And then I recalled all those conversations, particularly when we we're in Asia, there's no technology or science to prove this, Mark. And what did Billy's electromagnetic soul choose to communicate with me but a piece of technology? And that started the wheels turning in my mind, my brain, that I needed to write a book about how all of this is possible. The electromagnetic soul, we are connected by the light from the cosmic to the subatomic. And I call this presentation the NDE zone because that is the zone between our frequency and the afterlife frequency. And that experience led to me writing my latest book, The Afterlife Frequency. And I'm very humbled and honored. It's been endorsed by some of the top near-death experience researchers in the world. It won the cover Visionary Gold Award for Best Book in Reincarnation, Death, and Grieving. It just won this month Best Holistic Life Inspirational Book of the Year. And um, it is up for an OMI Award by OM Times and iSpirit Media. And the OMI Awards are tomorrow night. So I'm keeping my fingers crossed. Um, and if anyone wants to find out more about my work, the electromagnetic soul, how to develop the RAF technique, kindly visit my website, which is afterlifefrequency.com. And I want to thank um, Yvonne Kassan and Robert and Anne and everybody connected to this. And I especially want to thank all of the attendees. Thank you so much. God bless. Namaste. And if we have time for any questions, um, be happy to. Great. Thank you, Mark. If you can pull down the screen share, that's super. I hope everyone can hear me. I apologize for the technical problems earlier on. Can you hear me okay, Mark? Yes. Great. I'm wondering if uh, it might be all of our energy, all of our frequencies <laughs> here that are causing the technical problems because we've been having a bunch of technical problems. Do you want to comment on electromagnetic sensitivity, Mark? Do you write about that in your book? Of course I do. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one time I was I was talking I was giving a, um, a talk on spirituality and spirit communication, and I was talking about my mom, who was a very gifted medium, and she was in spirit. And all of a sudden, the light above me started flickering, and I go, "Hi, mom!" And then it stopped <laughs> flickering, and like it was great. It, it just yeah. You know, and the thing is, because spirits are electromagnetic souls. And electricity is electromagnetic energy. And that's why I brought in about Benjamin Franklin, because, you know, electricity had, had been, uh, scientists had, had identified it, but they didn't understand much about it until Benjamin Franklin came along and did this quantum leap. And then, as you can see, within a few years, Galvani, and then by the time we were into the 19th century, um, all types of, of um, uh, discoveries and advancements uh, began in the field of electricity. And then with the advent of quantum physics, we're now taking um, the, the distinction between Newtonian reductionist materialism, I think has faded. And we're now understanding that all of these phenomena that I've been discussing, it's not hocus pocus or some airy fairy uh, notion. This is real. And we are now at the point where we can prove this through science. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, we do have a few questions. Um, I, wa I wanted to mention one other thing. Uh, I was fascinated by what you said about the sense of scent, how you got the scent of your, your mother's perfume in your after-death communication. Interestingly enough, my own mother's after-death communication with me, it was her, her perfume that I smelled first before she came in visually and auditorially. And similarly with my fiance who died, it was his aftershave that came in. Yeah. So, so how frequent, frequently is it that the sense of uh, scent comes in first? I'm finding this rather odd because I'm a very visual well, person. 
Um, that's a frequency beacon. Also, there's another way of looking at this, which reinforces the frequency beacon. Smells are very powerful. We can smell something and it brings you back to, like you said, um, your mom, your fiance. Um, and inside our brain, the portion of our brain, which controls the olfactory senses is adjacent to our long-term memory. And that may be one of the reasons why spirits like to transmit these sensations to us, because th this is the technical aspect that it hits that memory and it all of a sudden it makes you think of them. And you also have to realize that spirits are moving at the speed of light because everything in the electromagnetic spectrum moves at 186,282 miles per second, which is almost 400,000 kilometers per second. So by the time we're sitting there trying to figure that out, it's like that's why they're you know doing this so quickly. And frequency beacons are just a wonderful phenomenon for once you start recognizing them, you'll realize how often and how prevalent spirit communication really is. Awesome. Um, another question is, um, what about after death communications that are through the phone or through email? Have you ever seen this occur? Let's see, phones and email both use what? Electromagnetic energy. <laughs> so there we are again, absolutely. In fact, my mother's best friend, Nancy, um, after my mom passed, you know, we disconnected her phone and Nancy kept getting calls from my mother's phone number and she'd answer it and there'd be like, whew, whew. and Nancy's a medium too. And she'd go, hi, Jean. <laughs> so she knew, so yes. Um, for phone, internet, um, all types of electrical devices, because once again, we're dealing with EMS, electromagnetic soul, and spirits are, are quite capable of influencing electrical fields, which is why that's a very popular way of them getting through to us. Now, prior to the 21st, in the 20th and 21st century, um, the spirit contact would be more in dreams or seeing them out of your peripheral vision, like I discussed in the section on the structure of the eye. Um, and technology is a double-edged sword because we are so focused on playing with technology in our cell phone that we tend to be diminishing our situational awareness. I saw a really funny post on Facebook it was um, a couple park benches. It was outside a park and everybody's sitting there and they're all looking at their cell phones and Bigfoot is walking behind them. And the caption was, this is why there's no recent pictures of Bigfoot because everyone's looking at their phone all the time and they're not paying attention to what's going on around them. Also recently in the news, it was in New England, there was a school bus and the bus driver had a heart attack and, and, and it was real serious. And this one 11 year old, year old boy jumped up, ran, grabbed the wheel and managed to maneuver the bus off the road and bring it to a stop. He was the only child on the bus that didn't have a cell phone. Every one of the other children were all playing with their cell phones. And he was interviewed on ABC World News and his parents said, no, we don't want our son having a cell phone. And the kid was making faces, but they said that he was the one that had situational awareness, saw what was happening, and did something about it. And if he'd had a cell phone and was playing with it like everybody else was, that could have gone and would have gone really badly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Incredible. Another question we've had from a couple people was about telepathy. So this is between two living people rather than between us and somebody who is on the other side. So how does this all connect to telepathy? Once again, the brain emits electromagnetic waves and frequencies. Thoughts are electromagnetic impulses. It's, it's um, I don't want to say easier, but it's, it's more prevalent to communicate with spirits because they're emitting an electromagnetic wave and their EM um, wave interfaces with the electromagnetic field in my body, in my brain, and it gets converted into recognizable concepts based on memories, feelings, and cultural associations. Theoretically, it's the same thing in telepathy. If you're able to transmit an EM pulse to another person, it operates on the same principle. In the afterlife frequency, uh, I uh, the electromagnetic soul 
is, is the building block to understand all these different forms of paranormal phenomenon. But the truth is, the paranormal is really normal, and the supernatural is really natural. People fear what they don't understand. They, they, um, they, 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 they distance themselves from it. But now that we're beginning to understand this, you should be no more afraid of a spirit than being afraid of the sky because it's blue or the grass because it's green. This is simply a fact of life. And when you approach something objectively and intelligently, you'll realize that there's no reason to be afraid. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, Anne had an interesting question. She said, when our state of awareness is expanded, have we actually raised our vibration? Without a doubt. Without a doubt. Because the more you engage in spiritual um, activities, prayer, meditation, um, psychic development, many of the things that, that um, you'll learn in the afterlife frequency, like the RAF technique, and many of the things that you will learn throughout this conference, are, it's all about awareness. One of the chapters in my book is called Spiritual Situational Awareness, and it, it would take too long for me to go into that, but, but by engaging in spiritual exercises, it's like anything else, you know, if you don't use it, you lose it, so let's get out there and think about it. Before before caller ID, I remember being a kid and the phone would ring and we'd go, oh, that's Uncle Joey. And we'd pick up the phone and it was Uncle Joey. It's because we had to do that then. Now with technology, which is wonderful, it's creating a bit of an insulation between us and our natural intuitive abilities. There's a funny line in the Harry Potter books where Hermione said that muggles, meaning non, non-magical people, invented technology in the internet because they don't have magic. <laughs> yeah, that is wonderful. <laughs> we have a question here from Dan, who says, I noticed that people who were strong personalities during life on, the, on this plane seem to appear more able to communicate from the other side. Have you experienced this as well? What I've experienced is that spirits communicate very much like they, from the other side, very much like they did when they were here. And it doesn't mean that they're more capable of communicating. It's just that they communicate in a similar fashion. And, and the joke that I like to use is, it's like when you communicate with spirits of people from the Midwest, they come through and they're like, hello. Yep. Good to be here. But when you communicate with the New York spirits, hey, how you doing? I got it's great to see you. You know, and it's just because if they all come through playing harps and la 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 la. All right, look, that's that's where the the charlatanism and the fraud comes in. Spirits are going to come through and they're going to communicate like they did when they were here. Why? Because those are indicators. Those are identifiers. Um, I won't use the language, but I was doing a reading for this husband and wife. Their son had passed. He came through. And I started blushing and they said, why are you blushing? I said, well, it's what he said. Well, what did he say? And I said it and it was like, F, 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 F. And the mother rolled her eyes and the father said, yep, that's our son. He was a Marine. And, and the, the mother said, yep. And every single adjective seemed to start with an F. That's our son. So what it was, and, and, you know, and I was like, well, you know, are they allowed to cuss in heaven? <laughs> But, but what it is, is we're going much, much uh, to a much deeper understanding of that, is that if their son came in like, oh, I am granola, I am happy, well, then that doesn't prove who he is. And that, once again, is, you know, the, these phony baloney people out there. But when you start getting facts and details, personality traits, then that is an indicator that that's who they say they are. So people that had the quote unquote outgoing personalities they have no more um, ability to communicate than someone who is more laid back and and uh, quiet. It just takes a little bit more time on our end working with those spirits. Okay. Um, just, we'll have one uh, final question. Now, several people have asked this, and I'm not quite sure if I understand the question, but 
They want to know about so-called bad communications and bad channeling. So I don't know if that means uh, if they're asking you whether sometimes the message gets mixed up in communication or if sometimes you'll actually get negative messages. So maybe you can answer both of those questions. In the 15,000 plus readings that I've done for people, and I've done them for um, uh, every aspect of society from people that, that are essentially homeless up to literally royalty, um, I've yet to encounter the boogeyman. Um, it's the interpretation of the messages, bad channeling, bad spirits. Uh, one of the issues that I have with my colleagues in the paranormal investigation world is they tend to want everything to be demonic and scary because scary sells. When you're going into paranormal investigation, you have to apply the scientific method of objective observation, collect the data, then after the data collection, then you review it, and that's when you form an intelligent and scientific um, opinion. Now, with the other possibility of the intent of the question, bad communication of, uh, as in bad messages, you have to be careful how you interpret something. Many people want to jump to a conclusion. I, if, if you can indulge me for a few minutes, okay, in one of the most, these are two documented cases, the Oracle of Delphi in ancient Greece. And, and Apollo was the god of prophecy, and Delphi was a temple to him, which was populated by these women, the priestesses of Apollo. And they would sit on this geo, uh, on this tripod, and a geothermal um, steam would come up, which many people believe was methylene, which can induce a trance-like and, and hallucinogenic state. But for 17 centuries, 1,700 years, the likes of Cleopatra, Julius Caesar, Mark Antony, Hadrian, Aristotle, I mean, the who's who of the ancient world, high and low, all came to consult the Oracle of Apollo. Well, in the 5th century, 6th to 5th century BC, King Croesus, who was king of what is now Turkey, went to consult the Oracle of Apollo because he was really worried about the, the rapidly expanding Persian Empire. In other words, Iran was causing trouble in the Middle East 2,500 years ago. Imagine that, you know. And so, so Croesus goes to the Oracle of Apollo and says, what do I do about the Persians? And the response was, if you attack the Persians, you will destroy a mighty empire. Well, he got his army and his allies together, and he launched an attack on the Persians. They annihilated his army, killed him, and occupied all of what is now Turkey. The prophecy came true. If you attack the Persians, you will destroy a mighty empire, your own. But then, a generation later, the Persians had crossed from Turkey into what is now Bulgaria, and were now closing in on Greece itself. And Pericles, the leader of the Athenians, because Greece was a number of city-states, went to consult the Oracle of Apollo. And the response was, Athens will be saved from behind wooden walls. Well, Athens didn't have wooden walls, but Pericles and his advisors, they thought they knew what it meant. So the Persian army, probably numbering over 100,000 men, which is a lot in the ancient world, and we all probably saw the movie or heard about the 300, where the 300 Spartans held them off at the Thermopylae, but then they were overwhelmed, and the Persians broke through, and they captured the city of Athens, but they found out that it was deserted, and they burned it to the ground. But then the Persian navy was closing in on the Aegean Sea. The Athenians had evacuated everyone to the island of Salamis. So the whole Athenian population was on Salamis, and the Persian navy was closing in on it. Meanwhile, the Athenian navy, much smaller, but their ships were, um, were more maneuverable, they lured the Persians into a narrow channel, and they started running aground and colliding with each other. And so there's this huge, huge catastrophe and, and chaotic mess. And so the Athenians started picking off the Persian ships with these flaming catapults, and they destroyed the Persian fleet. The wooden walls were ships. And the Athenians interpreted 
Athens will be saved from behind wooden walls. And this is not Greek mythology. This is not the Iliad or the Odyssey. This was historically documented fact at the time. And for those who probably don't know, the Persian army didn't fare much better in Greece because the uh, Spartans, the Athenians, the Corinthians, and the Thebans clobbered them at the Battle of Marathon. But anyway, so, so the reason I bring that up is there are two interpretations from that, that could be taken different ways. So when messages from spirits come through, just don't jump to conclusions. Let it settle in and then arrive at the, 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 um, the interpretation. But I will say this. Messages from spirits are never about anger, bigotry, hatred, or violence. They are not negative. They are not bad. So when I start seeing these terrorists and, and the media talks about their spiritual advisors, no, those people are not spiritual advisors. They're religious fanatics. Like a really hateful religious fanatic died earlier this week. Name shall remain not disclosed. Okay. But people like that are not speaking for spirits or God. They're speaking from their ego, which is edging God out. And that's why people will say, well, God hates this type of people. The ultimate act of ego is creating God in your own image so that then you get to tell everybody that God hates the same people you do. The difference is that messages from the divine, messages from spirits are about peace, love, inner peace, healing, and protection. And that's how you know the difference, because messages from spirits are about peace, love, healing, protection, understanding. So I hope that answers the question. Thank you, Mark. That was an incredible answer to a complex question. And this was a really, really phenomenal presentation. So on behalf of everyone here, thank you. We really look forward to watching this video. And a lot of people are looking forward to reading your book. So thank you. Thank you. And for um, everybody, I'll be in Houston this next week at Body, Mind, and Soul, and I'll be on the um, CBS KHOU morning show, Great Day Houston. Um, if you want to sign up for any of my other events, um, please go to my website, afterlifefrequency.com, just like my book, Afterlife Frequency. Yvonne, once again, thank you so much. And Yvonne, thank you for founding Spiritual Awakenings International. Um, I know you coined the, tra the, the, the term spiritually transformative experience, but Yvonne, you are a spiritually transformative experience. Thank you so much.